Okay, perfect. It says that we are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Carwan. This is Ishan Sharma, and you're watching the Carwan live lecture. And uh, welcome to this lecture, which you can see the title uh, is titled as uh, Mughal Gardens Myths and Realities. And to deliver this lecture, we have a very special guest, somebody who is a known name in the field of art history. and she doesn't really need an introduction she is a legend in her own rights professor laura parodi who is currently associated with university of genova in italy and uh, let me introduce the theme uh, of today's session so mughal gardens are such a prominent part of the architectural heritage of india but it is largely uh, if you can say misunderstood and uh, today we'll see a different approach of looking at mughal gardens um and in and in, in uh, an ecological approach uh, you know if we see an ecological approach of this gardens are just but uh, physical traces of the way land was managed at a given time what if we got the narrative badly wrong um in the sense we perceive mughal gardens today so you'll see a great many surprises that even i am not aware of right now and uh, if you are watching this and if you have any question related to the theme you can always send them in the live chat that i will be reading out towards the end uh, of the session so without further ado i think uh, i i'll i'll ask professor parodi to take uh, take from here uh and thank you so much ma'am for accepting the invitation for joining um for for joining us this evening this afternoon for you uh for the carwan special lecture over to you ma'am thank you so much and i'll i'll, okay. I'll join you after the session okay so thank you for this great opportunity to share some of my ideas and some recent findings that i haven't had an opportunity to share before today So I'm aware that there's going to be a a slight time lag um, in visualizing the slides, and that's why I've not I won't be using too many slides today. I'll mostly be talking. So when doing historical research, it's important to separate fact from fiction. Um, fiction is a useful source in its own right. Uh, mind you but of a different nature it provides information about the prevalent paradigms and categories perhaps even self re- reflection at a given time but ideally fiction should remain separate from facts and we can directly relate to this i think because in our own time there's some toxic um myths toxic narratives that circulate that threaten to obscure historical research and um while we m- may never hope to know the actual truths about the past it is possible to discern fact from fiction up to a point and that's the job of historians of course and i regard myself as a historian before anything else and today i would like to discuss and dispel certain scholarly myths that uh, surround uh islamic gardens and mughal gardens and originate almost 100 years ago myths that still weigh heavily on our perception of mughal gardens and in fact i won't be talking very much about mughal gardens as around them if you wish so i'll be talking about things that matter to an understanding of mughal gardens and these are myths concerning the origin of persian islamic and of course by extension mughal gardens as well um and the reason i want to expose these myths before i go on to introduce my current thoughts about the origins of mughal gardens is because these myths are treated as realities or in other words as as the outcome of, of solid research when they're not um and these myths have actually prevented research on the real origin of islamic persian and mughal gardens for an entire century and i don't claim to have found all the answers regarding the origin of our beloved gardens but debunking the myths it's certainly a first step and as i hope to demonstrate today debunking myths and examining documents afresh with an open mind can lead to surprising results 
Now, you've probably heard of the myth according to which, or the theory according to which Persian, Islamic, and by extension, Mughal gardens are essentially replicas of paradise based on an ancient Iranian concept which views paradise as a garden divided into four quadrants. This concept is usually subsumed in the word Chaharba, which is taken to mean or thought to mean a paradise garden divided into four quadrants. This is a kind of foundational myth, myth for uh, writings on Islamic gardens. And if you're not familiar with my published work, you may actually think that the idea is based on solid research. But it's actually just a myth with no scientific basis. And I like to um, call it a, a meme that went viral before the internet even existed. And you excuse my cat for always photobombing and video bombing my talks. Anyway, a meme that went viral before the internet was even invented. But like so many viral memes, it was based on fake news. So let's review a few facts. First of all, there is no mention of a garden divided into four quadrants in Zoroastrianism, Iran's ancient religion. In fact, paradise is not even conceived as a garden in Zoroastrianism. Oops, right? Donald Wilbur's classic book, Persian Garden, Garden Pavilions, barely mentions the Paradise Garden theory and astutely limits the discussion to well-documented Safavid and Qatar gardens, none of which are divided into four parts. More recently, Mohammad Garipur's similarly titled book, Persian Gardens and Pavilions, mentions the theory, but soon admits that the Zoroastrian heaven is not associated with any particular garden because it is imagined as spiritual territory. Garipur also states, and I quote, that a comprehensive review of Persian poetry confirms a dominant materialistic view of gardens and pavilions. Furthermore, and I quote, in several verses, the garden is considered the symbol of a material world in contrast to the eternal world after death, that is paradise. This suggests that in poetry, the perception of a garden as a symbol of paradise or the Garden of Eden is quite inconsistent." End of quote. Now to this, we may add, and it may come as a surprise, that the word charbag is actually not mentioned in classical Persian poetry. But try this for yourself. Do a search on a well-known uh, repository of Persian poetry online, Ganjur, using the word charbag, and you'll be surprised. There are actually zero results. Yes, that's right. The word doesn't exist in classical Persian poetry. The word bag is common and frequent, but the word chahar bag is not. However, if you do a search using the Mughal spelling char bag, a few, a handful of results will turn up. Now, these are always um, from poets that either worked at the Mughal court, such as Urfi Shirazi, or um, there's a couple of poets who worked in Zand or Qajar, Iran, that is after Nadir Shah's uh, raid on Delhi. That, that should, you know, tell us something. Um, so none of the big shots of Fez, Saadi, or the Shahnameh mention Charbaz. And as you can see, actually, this photograph I, I chose to show is a detail of a larger garden. There aren't so many gardens divided into four quadrants, and there, admittedly, they are concentrated in Mughal India, but we'll see what that leads to. Now, it's important to understand how the meme came about, or the theory, and how it went viral. So we can separate fact from fiction, or begin to separate fact from fiction. And to cut a very long story short, this theory actually has a father, a mother, and a birth date. It is first found in the Survey of Persian Art, published in 1938. Um, this is part of an early interest in, in Oriental, quote unquote, Oriental gardens um, in colonial empires. And of course, British India was the case there. Um, this was also the 1920s and 30s, the time when the earliest global histories of art got written. And this is part of that effort. Um, 
early art historians and early writers on, on, on gardens were often amateurs. Uh, they were pioneers, right? And they deserve credit for their efforts, but they had limited knowledge of or quote unquote oriental civilizations and very limited access to historical sources. In fact, um, they rarely had the language knowledge required to approach other civilizations and they relied on the few sources that have been published in English. And of course, those from British India were some of the sources that were translated really early. And the word charbagh was found there and it attracted the attention of early art historians. And because it suggested the idea of a garden divided into four parts, it lent itself to a comparison with the Garden of Eden, of Eden from the Bible, which these people were familiar with. And coincidentally, philology, which was a bit more advanced and where people had knowledge of, of these oriental languages, had discovered that the word paradise in a number of languages from European languages to Arabic comes from an ancient Iranian word meaning um, walled uh, or encircled garden. So Pairideza. And they thought, well, yeah, the word paradise comes from ancient Iran. And here we have a word meaning four gardens. So clearly it's one and the same. And all paradise concepts come from ancient Iran. Um, such naive explanations were not unusual in the early 20th century, uh, but most of these theories have just been shoved to, into the bin long ago. And this one is an exception. And what is extraordinary about it is, is the longevity of this meme and its persistent popularity and the way it has actually prevented research on potential other origins of these gardens. The survey was a monumental effort. It was a catalog of art and architecture in Iran from prehistoric times to historic times. And its documentary value is immense, particularly in the vast number of photographs of buildings and objects that are now lost to us or have been significantly modified over time. But the people who wrote the survey were not professionals, with the only exception of Ernst Herzfeld, who excavated Samara and was one of the contributors. The chapter on gardens specifically in this book was written by the editors of the survey, Arthur Pope and his wife, Phyllis Ackerman, that you see credited here. And their work in Iran depended directly on the support of the Shah of Iran, on the support of the Pahlavi's dynasty. And here we see political agendas and personal agendas infiltrating scholarship. Um, and that's something that should never happen in an ideal world, of course, but it does happen. And so claiming that Iran was the origin of the concept of paradise was beneficial to their research. It was beneficial to their cause. Ackerman, moreover, had a degree in Western philosophy and she'd written a dissertation about Hegel who was all about the ultimate symbolism of forms. And um, she was more interested in philosophical reasoning than historical facts. And actually the chapter of, on gardens in the survey, and if you, if you ever have a chance to look at it, it's, it's interesting in terms of historiography because it is framed as a philosophical question not a historical question. And the question is what constitutes the essence of a Persian garden? And the answer is bits and pieces of evidence from different time periods and different civilizations in Iran. And the evidence is actually twisted sometimes to fit into the theory and support it. It's a bit as if someone was trying to find the essence of an Indian house, say, and they mixed and matched evidence from the Indus civilization all the way down to the Mughals, uh, jumping back and forth in time. And no one would buy that narrative, right? So how, do, how come we still buy into this theory when it comes to Persian gardens? Is it because of the allure of paradise? Maybe. Is it because, as a lot of memes 
it's been retweeted so many times, repeated so many times that it has gained, gained authority. It is perceived as authoritative, even though it's not. And let's review just a couple of facts. I hope you're able now to see a slide with two pre-Islamic Sasanian, Sasanian palaces that Pope Anacharman mention as the earliest evidence of gardens divided into four quadrants and that their um, idea of, of this, this kind of gardens that there should be a cross axis, so two channels intersecting with a building in the exact center, a cosmic di diagram, a bit like a mandala, okay? And here you have these two palaces. Do you see any of that, seriously? Mm. Not really. So there's even here is even more surprising stuff. When the survey got written, nothing was known of gardens in Iran before the Sasanians. And the Royal Achaemenian Palace in Pazargad was only excavated in the 1960s. And when traces of a garden came to light in that palace, it was a huge disappointment to find that it was not divided into four parts. And I hope you can see an image of the plan now as it was published in the original excavation report on the left. It's actually republished, but for the present purposes, it's fine. So first published that way. So as you see on the left, and then a few years later, and with each, each time it was republished, it was changed a little bit until it finally came to coincide with the theory and support it. So in 1989, a visual axis was postulated. The same person who had excavated the palace, possibly under the pressure of the international community said, you know, there has to be a four part garden there, come on, there has to be started saying, well, yes, someone seated in the pavilion would have created a visual axis across it. So why not? There's a visual cross axis. And then uh, in a moment, you're going to see another slide that shows another um, version, a later version where the visual axis becomes another channel. <laughs> so this is only one example, but there would be a few more of evidence that was twisted ad hoc to fit the theory rather than the other way around. And this should never happen, but it's happened a few times when it comes to uh, the so-called paradise gardens. Incidentally, those channels you see are not quite like the channels in Mughal gardens, because if you look carefully, there are pools at regular intervals. And I believe those pools are actually pits for planting trees. So these would not have been channels, they would have been um, rows of trees, hedges possibly, so not channels at all. So anyway, oops, sorry, I was going a bit too far. So there'd be a lot more to say on how this theory was rediscovered and applied to all Islamic gardens, not just Persian gardens in the 1970s, but there's no time to do it here. Um, I promise to publish something someday <laughs> to again, cut a very, very long story, very, very short. It was a combination of international politics with the rising importance of the Gulf states in the 1970s that led to a sudden burst of interest in Islamic culture and all Islamic art. And on the other hand, it was the popularity of structuralism in academic circles in those years. Or to be fully accurate, structuralism had already fallen out of favor in literary theory, but uh, it was embraced. It had been embraced by architectural historians in, in those years. So, and that's why essays from the period are all about form and meaning, form and meaning, form and meaning. Finding a form, disclosing its symbolic meaning. And as architectural historians in the 1970s uh, looked out for a definition of Islamic gardens, the closest they could find was the chapter on gardens in Pope and Ackerman's survey, uh, survey. And that's why, that's how I believe the um, narrative was transferred from Persian gardens to all Islamic gardens. Okay, so, but wait, 
if the origins of Mughal gardens are not in pre-Islamic Iran, where should we look? And where do they come from? Well, you're probably familiar with the name of Rashid Din, or that Rashid Din, the, the historian, the great historian who compiled a world history or assembled a team of people to compile a world history in the early 14th century at the Mongol court in Iran, at the Ilhani court. Rashid Din devotes plenty of space uh, to gardens in his book. He mentions gardens invariably. Whenever he associates prosperity with a certain city, he mentions gardens. And he also devotes space to the building of, of canals in support of agriculture in his own time. But there's no time to dwell on that. We're going to focus on just one reference in Rashid Din that is especially relevant in this connection. And that's where he writes about Futo, a Chinese city situated on the banks of the Sangang River, where he says, there are many grapes and fruits. And even more interestingly, um, Rashid Din goes on to say that there is, and I quote, there is another, quoting from Willa Thaksin's translation of, of the passage, there's another town near the city and it is called Simali. Most people there are from Samarkand and they have built many gardens after the manner of Samarkand. Berasma Samarkand is what he says. This is an extraordinary piece of information. Basically, Rashid Adin is saying that people from Samarkand, people in Samarkand had a unique gardening tradition of their own and it was so well known that he did not feel like he had to explain it. So what do we make of this? Um, archaeologists who work on pre-Islamic Central Asia are telling me that even in ancient times, there was something special about the landscape around Samarkand and the other great city of what was once Sogd or Sogdia and is now part of Uzbekistan. The other great cities, of course, Bukhara. Both Samarkand and Bukhara were are situated along the course of the, the Zarafshan River, um, which I believe was called Juhan in antiquity. The Zarafshan is a tributary of the Amudarya, or which the ancient Greeks called the Oxus. Um, so the region is also known as Transoxiana or in Arabic sources, Mawaranah, what's behind, beyond the river. Um, the region is now significantly more arid than it was in ancient times, but that's largely as a result of the over-exploitation of, aquif of aquifers and, and the Soviet decision uh, of growing cotton in the area, which as we all know, has led to almost to the disappearance of the Aral Sea. So uh, the collapse of the Aral Sea. <clears throat> but at the time of the Islamic conquest in the eighth century of the common era, not to mention earlier, water was abundant in Sogdia. And in fact, I'm told by specialists of the pre-Islamic period that by the Bronze Age, if not earlier, Sogdia was crisscrossed by a system of open air channels that were used in support of agriculture. This was a very different environment from that of Arabia and most of the Iranian plateau, which with the exception of the Caspian Sea, which has a different climate. Um, you know, the Iranian plateau, uh, water is scarce for the most part, and, 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 and it had to be carried uh, across uh, vast distances. And you're probably familiar with the concept of a kanat. So where water is scarce and where water comes from distant foothills, you dig um, underground channels. That's partly, that's mostly to preserve water from evaporating. Water is a precious resource, it is scarce, and you carry it across vast distances in underground channels. This is completely different from um, Central Asia, where open air canals carry water across distances where necessary, and then you have 
networks of, again, open air channels distributing it. Also in these regions, um, channels, these systems of waterworks were not only visible, but they were an integral part of the fabric of cities. And this must be what Rashid Dean means when he refers to gardens built after the manner of Samarkand. But is there any indication that this was an ancient tradition? I mean, that gardens really were part of the fabric of cities in these areas. Well, I already mentioned the archeological data and we also need to mention that people from Samarkand or Sogdia more generally had uh, established communities in China, such as that mentioned by Rashid Din um, and elsewhere along the Silk Road long before the advent of Islam. Uh, the earliest evidence of, of, of Sogdian communities in China found them mistaken dates from well, about 2000 years ago. Um, and Sogdians were distantly related to the people of Iran and they're usually described as an Eastern Iranian people, but they had their own language and their own religion and their own distinctive culture. So why not their distinctive agriculture as Rashid Din is suggesting? Um, in ancient times, Sogdia was not a kingdom like Iran, uh, but it was a series of city states. And that might be one reason why we're not, um, it is not as visible, right? We don't have the sources celebrating this culture in legendary terms as we have for Iran, perhaps, you know? Um, and I'd like to pick up this issue in, in the Q&A, if you're interested. Now, this Chinese city built by people from Samarkand, mentioned by Rashid Din, may have been in existence for centuries, even before the advent of Islam, who knows? What we do know is that gardens were so important for the Sogdian people that even while in China, some of them chose to be portrayed while entertaining guests in their orchards and gardens on their funerary couches. And you have a detail here from a funerary couch from Sogdia, uh, well, from China, but made for a Sogdian patron, uh, dating to, if I'm not mistaken, 579 of the common era. And you can find more details on this couch on the Smithsonian uh, Institution website, where there's a, a bit more information on it. So um, funerary couches in themselves are a Chinese tradition, but the decoration of the couches commissioned by Sogdian patrons is different. And it's different in that it portrays the pe these people while banqueting, listening to music, entertaining or being entertained, as you see in, in this image. Um, now, what evidence do we have for these gardens in Central Asia, not in China, in Central Asia, besides some archeological remains of, of agricultural channels? Um, and well, we have a source, not on Samarkand, but on the other big city on the Zerafshan, and Bukhara, that, um, tells us something about these gardens just before the Arab conquest and shortly afterwards. And then, you know, um, and that's the history of Bukhara. The history of Bukhara was written um, originally in Arabic and it has uh, at the Samanid court in the 10th century um, of the common era. It has come down to us in a later Persian translation. Um, and so the text doesn't exactly reflect uh, 10th century Bukhara, but um, it's, it's a proxy for that. Um, it remains an important source of information on the transition from pre-Islamic to Islamic in that area. Um, and sure enough, the text contains numerous references to gardens. It says more specifically that Bukhara was founded in an area of swamps 
where water was collected from the melting snow of the districts around Samarkand. And it says that both nomadic and sedentary people were drawn to the area by this abundance of water. Now, in my understanding in a swamp, canals are used not so much for irrigation, but to actually drain water from land that is too wet to grow anything upon. And the patches of land in between the channels, and the word we find in sources from this early period is uh, the same as in Mughal sources, chaman. Okay, so a patch of land. Um, these patches, in my understanding, were probably patches with raised borders to protect them from flooding. We still see this technique used in Afghanistan to this day. I, I came across, uh, a few months ago, I came across um, a video film before the Taliban takeover where there were people around Jalalabad just digging exactly this type of raised channels. And I must apologize, I forgot to insert that famous picture of Babur um, supervising work at his charbag in Jalalabad. And if you look carefully, you will see that these are raised beds with canals flowing uh, in between them. And I believe it's the same thing. Anyway, um, we, can, we can see that um, later on perhaps. So there's a whole chapter in the history of Bukhara that's devoted to these big canals, root, they're called, that fed the various districts around Bukhara. The text also says that at the time of the Arab conquest, the inhabitants of Bukhara were ordered to give half of their houses to the Arabs. And then the rich merchants of Bukhara moved outside the city and the text says, they constructed 700 villas, Kushk, outside the town. Um, and each of these villas had a bustan, so an orchard, and a Sahra, and Sahra is a strange word. We don't usually find it in, in, in association, in these sources, in association with houses. It's more of a jungle, so it probably was a game park. We know these game parks existed around Bukhara in, in, when, when the Turks came in, in Karahanid and Seljuk times. So perhaps it was the same kind of concept. Another version of the same story is by, by the compiler of, of the Persian version of the history. And it says that some quarters of the city of Bukhara was, were dispersed far from one another, like villages. And the word he uses is Rustal. <clears throat> now, what is striking here is that Samarkand will be described in very similar terms centuries later in Timur's time. And that's what's relevant for scholars of Mughal gardens, of course as a city that looked like a series of villages. And we'll come to that. There'd be so much more to say on these early sources, but I'd like to just briefly mention that uh, the section in the history that deals with uh, Dui Mulian, a uh, green district named after the, the canal that fed it, um, is, is uh, that section of the history says that the Samanids built their royal resident, residence in this suburban district. Um, the residence is called the Sarai, which of course is a, is a word, again, familiar word for us. And members of the elite also built their Sarais there, along with gardens and the word used is bog, uh, chaman, so cultivated patches and orchards, bustan. Um, through which we are told water constantly flowed with hundreds of intersections so that it was impossible to know where it came from or where it went. And the reason I'm insisting on this point is that this concept of running water, Abiravan, recurs in Timurid and Mughal sources. There's this concept of running water, flowing water, and of course, it's the first thing that Babur mentions when, when it comes to to the banks of the Jumna, that there was no running water. Where's the running water? And that is the kind of landscape that he had in mind. So bear with me for going about, going on about, you know, Bukhara for a bit longer, but I think it's relevant. Um, 
there was another fertile district, the history says, uh, between the citadel, um, the, the Registan at the foot of Bukhara's citadel and, and the fertile plain that lay beyond. And in that district were houses, Khona, uh, well proportioned and, and decorated with stone. There were Mehman Khone, so inns, caravanserais perhaps, decorated with paintings, uh, There were beautiful charbags. Whoa, here's the word, charbags. Lovely fountains and trees. This is the earliest recorded instance of the word charbag, um, apparently, well, to the best of our knowledge. The source does not clarify what they were or what they looked like, but it does go on to say that in these char box were abundant fruits, pears, almonds, hazels, cherries, grapes, all sorts of fruits that you can find. And in, even in paradise, that's what the text says. And so if paradise is, and paradise is behisht, of course, but uh, the, um, if there's a comparison with paradise, it's invariably in the abundance of fruit. It's not about a particular form, it's about how lovely a life you can enjoy there because there's so much food. Okay, so consist this is a consistent theme that we find again and again in Timurid Mughal sources. Um, yeah, so, and I'm wondering, there's very little information on gardens in Iran at this time, around this time. Um, interestingly, the first mention, for example, first recorded mention, there might be sources that we haven't tapped into, but the first recorded mention of gardens in Isfahan dates from the reign of Malik Shah, the Seljuk ruler. But Malik Shah had conquered Bukhara. So what if he got the idea from there? I don't know. We need to do more work on a broader spectrum of sources. And I hope that dispelling the myth will help us engage with these sources. Now, after the fall of the Samanids, their empire was divided between three Turkic dynasties, the Ghaznavids, the Karahanids, and the Seljuks. The Ghaznavids were originally uh, military slaves or Mamalik, Mamluk of the Samanids. And like them, they adopted Persian as their court language. And the main source that we have for gardens in the Ghaznavid period is Behaki, who wrote a history of the reign of Masud. Masud was the son of the famous Mahmud of Ghazna, of course, um, or infamous Mahmud of Ghazna. And he reigned for only a decade. And, and um, only a fraction of Behaki's history is preserved. And it's not representative of all of Ghaznavid history, only a fraction of it. Um, unfortunately, however enjoyable Behaki is, and he has a real um, gist for uh, the character of people, he has no interest in gardens. And I don't think a single species of plant is mentioned in his, um, in his work. He does more, get mention gardens more than 80 times in the surviving portions of it, his work, if I count it correctly, but he does not describe them. He, um, from his descriptions, um, I feel my, my current feeling uh, of Ghaznavid uh, gardens is that they were integrated into palaces and the palaces and their ceremonial uses were more similar to those of Abbasid palaces perhaps than what we see in Bukhara. And that might be because the Ghaznavids depended so much on Abbasid endorsement and they exchanged so many embassies with the Abbasids. But, you know, this is, um, but what we do know is that the everyday activities of the Ghaznavid court took place in gardens, including public audiences and, and the workings of the chancery. So, there is a sort of precedent for things we, we then see at the Mughal court. Now, um, there is one anecdote of interest, however, um, and it's where Behaki says that his master, Bunastra, owned a residence, Sarai, uh, with gardens on three sides, and he wanted to purchase the remaining piece of land so it would become a Sarai Charba. So 
That's the second known old reference to char baths. Does it mean a house with a garden on all four sides? Does it describe a special form? We don't know. Um, the word seemingly disappears until it suddenly reappears in Timurid Herat in the second half of the 15th century, so Timurid times. And by then it means something else. And we can definitely say what it is because it's even precisely described in an agricultural treatise that have been studied in depth by Maria Sabtelny, so I won't get into that. But it is a terrace garden with um, a residence or a building at one end and the channel bisecting the garden. Um, and the point I want to make that is that throughout the kind of history I've been trying to sketch, we are seeing landlords trying to make these gardens as productive as possible. And we find the same thing in Babur, for example, when he brags about his success with sugarcane and bananas, and Jahangir, when he talks about the pineapples grown in one of Babur's old gardens in, on the banks of the Jumna. So these really were uh, productive estates. They were sources of revenue. And that's the biggest thing that I think has not been considered enough because the myth has obscured it. So um, let's jump to the, um, let's see. So, and then when Timur makes Samarkand the capital of a world empire for the first time in history, what does he do? He builds humongous gardens. <laughs> and Lisa Kallenbeck has very, um, has, has conducted great research on these gardens and she's demonstrated that they were actually estates built for the ladies there. But if we now add to this, the productive or ecological dimension of gardens, if you want, then we can begin to see because what they really were for, because we tend to see gardens as pleasure gardens. But if we look at them as productive estates and residences, which is what they were apparently in that part of the world, then you see the ladies of, of the Timori court were left behind in Samarkand, sometimes for years, Timur would only take one wife, the youngest wife, with him on the campaigns and on his campaigns. And so these people had to stay behind with their large retinues in Samarkand. They had to live off the land. They had to feed their vast retinues. And so that seems to make sense. Okay, so Clavijo's descriptions of these gardens are closely reminiscent of what we see in Bukhara. Um, he describes Samarkand as a large city lying in a plain surrounded by mud ramparts and a deep moat with extensive suburbs full of vineyards and orchards. And in between the vineyards and orchards were busy streets and squares where bread, meat and all kinds of stuff were sold. More people, he says, lived outside the city than inside. And the orchards and the city, guess what, were crisscrossed by a network of channels. And he says, muchas acequias de agua. He was, you know, he came from Castile, so he had seen the Islamic gardens back there. Melons and cotton were grown in large quantities, and all of the elite had their own residences in these suburbs. This was so extensive that Samarkand, seen when a traveler was approaching, looked like a great mountainous height of trees and the houses embowered among them remain invisible. If that sounds familiar, well, yeah. Um, he, uh, I, I knew I was going to run late today. It's not my usual thing, but, but I'll stay within the, you know, 55-ish minutes, I promise. There's so much more to say. Um, I wanted to really, you know, paint a canvas of, I had to dispel a myth and, and paint a new, a new world, you know. So now, orchards and running waters that are part of a city. Um, Clavijo notes 
the presence of channels and pools uh, inside gardens. And without going into too much detail, let's just recap the basics of a description of a garden where he was, um, where he set up his tent for, for a few days. There was a large channel running down the middle of the garden from the top where there was a terrace with a residence. Does that sound familiar? Yes. And there were six pools and we already imagined these as terraces. And there were five avenues, calles, he says, connecting these six pools. So these were sections of the channel. From, they were bordered by trees. And from these big avenues, further channels departed that watered the remainder of the garden. So here we have the basic structure that we are going to find. And there were tall trees planted all around the garden. There was a vineyard as big as a garden, just adjacent to it. Okay, now this connection with agriculture is also confirmed by official sources in Timur's time, where we would look in vain for descriptions of gardens as images of paradise. Instead, for example, in Yesdis Zaparname, um, we find a lavish praise uh, of each individual tree species and sometimes even the particular varieties of, 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 of fruits grown in one of Timur's gardens. Now, fast forward, fasten your seatbelts to Herat in the second half of the 15th century in Herat, in Khorasan, present day Afghanistan. Urban and suburban gardens existed in Herat since at least the 14th century. They had been built by the Karts who had accepted Mongol, Mongol suzerainty. Um, and when Timur died and his son Sharukh moved the court to Herat, um, he restored the gardens built by the Karts and he resided in them. But something new seems to happen in the second half of the 15th century. And that's exactly when the word Charbagh begins to gain currency. And guess who arrived in, summer, in Herat in the second half of the 15th century? Sultan Abu Said, Babur's grandfather. He arrived in Herat from Samarkand. Now, Abu, Sultan Abu Said only reigned for a decade. He was killed on the battlefield and his more famous successor, successor in Herat, Sultan uh, Hussein, went on to transform Herat into a garden city, much like Bukhara and Samarkand had been. But this was possible because uh, Babur's grandfather, Sultan Abu Said, had built a channel there, a new channel, the Jewish Sultani. There were previous channels in Herat, but he had built a channel that created uh, the basis for this expansion and transformation. And he, during his reign, um, a channel was built in Kabul that transformed Kabul into a garden city for the first time as well. And if you check out my recent article in, in the latest issue of Mukarnas, where I describe um, Kabul at the turn of the 16th century, um, it was, there were three main gardens in Kabul that the Mughals used throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, and they formed the basis. Kabul was really the blueprint, I'm arguing there, for the big cities in Hindustan. Um, for the transformation of the riverfronts in Hindustan. And um, they were all Timurid gardens and they originate with Babur's grandfather who had come in from Samarkand. So that's a possible narrative, you know, that these gardens really originate in a place where water was abundant, not scarce that they originate in a specific agricultural landscape, not in some mythical idea of paradise. And as a sort of closing, some closing remarks, I would encourage you to read Babur's famous rant upon arrival in the plains of Hindustan in the light of this new evidence. When he gets there on, on the Jamna river front and he, and he says, oh, you know, what's, What's happening here? I can't even build my own charbagh here. 
there's so much dust, it's so hot, it's so there, there's no running water. So running waters were these channels that he was familiar with. What if, what if Babur really meant to say, not how do I go about recreating my favorite corner of paradise, but for goodness sake, this is the fabulously rich country of Hindustan. And I've come here, all, I've come here all the way to find a new home for myself and the displaced Timurid elites and our dependents, our people who are refugees and have lost their home country. And for the life of me, these folks here in Hindustan have all these big rivers. You would think that they'd go about building channels so they have running waters and plenty of orchards, but no, they've not done anything here. Where are the orchards? Babur identifies agriculture and orchards specifically as the main source of revenue in an empire. And that's why he devotes so much space to the detailing of what grows where in each of the three territories that he successively ruled in or ruled over. Um, <clears throat> so this point of view is especially explicit. And that's another passage that I really invite you to reconsider. In his chronicle of the years uh, 1508 to 1509, when he develops the route from Kabul to the Khyber Pass in preparation of his Hindustan campaigns. And he says, there's no agriculture there. And, but elsewhere, he does mention grains and pulses. So what he really means is there's no irrigated agriculture, no orchards. And he goes on to build these orchards. And unfortunately, there's a 10 year gap. So we see the beginning of the process with his first charbag, outside Jalalabad, and we see the end result of the process when he's built charbags on both sides of the Khyber Pass by 1519. These gardens and charbags were really just the royal gardens from among them, were built in support of permanent garrisons. They were built in support of armies in transit, and they were built more generally in support of the revenues for the land. And when Shah Jahan um, again needs to travel in the opposite direction, because the front there, uh, the front line in his time is with the Safavids in Kandahar, he builds his own additional royal gardens along that route and restores the gardens built by Babur along that route and in Kabul itself. Okay, so lessons to take home from, from this. Um, there's a lot of wonderful research on Mughal gardens, particularly from Ebakor, Jim Westcote, fantastic work on historical, on the history and the biographies of garden, on the ecological aspects of garden. And, and so it's just, it has remained disconnected from the myth of the origin of these gardens, I think looking back to Central Asia and to an alternate narrative that is historical and ecological will help us connect these, this research on Mughal gardens to something bigger, to a much bigger picture. And, um, I don't even know where to start with, with uh, <laughs> you know, the conclusions, but um, what if, you know, yeah, let's just close on, on a very simple consideration and it's what can we learn the, in a nutshell, what can we learn from this story is that when political agendas infiltrate history or personal agendas infiltrate history, it's always a bad thing. Um, but there may be a grain of truth in, in what the early travelers in Iran said about these gardens, which seem to be built against the arid landscape then prevalent in Iran. 
Well, what if they were? What if they were like the lawns that the British insisted on building, on, on, on growing on the grounds of Mughal Gardens? What if that tradition originated not in scarcity of water, but in abundance of water? And yeah, that's <laughs> just some of the ideas I wanted to suggest here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Parodi, for that wonderful, uh, we can say, we can call it an introduction because the, the universe of yeah, even the even the Chahar Bagh and the Mughal Gardens is, is is boundless and it's it's limitless. And as many, we we are receiving so many messages in the chat that, um, that people are now more interested in learning about uh, the Mughal Gardens more than ever. And... Um, I'm really happy and uh, honored to have Eva Koch uh, in our uh, audience panel as well. And she has asked you a question. Let's let's start from there. And those who want to ask questions, you have to do one thing. Uh, you have to just click on the subscribe button. It's a red button just below, just in front of the channel's name to ask questions in the live chat. Uh, we have a question uh, by Professor Koch. What about the cross cross axial uh, square element in the Royal Gardens of uh, Sigriya in um, Sri Lanka, laid out by King Kashyap in the fifth fifth century AD? Yeah, well, considering that, uh, yeah, I, I'm aware that someone wrote a whole book claiming that this was a Sasanian idea. The problem is, Sasanian gardens don't look like that, and earlier gardens in Iran don't look like that, but in Buddhism, there is a concept of the cosmos with a cosmic mountain and, you know, the four directions are so important. That's the that's principle of mandalas in, 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 in Buddhism. They find it a lot in Tibetan culture. We don't have to look to Iran for that. We should look to Buddhism. And similarly, I think that when this form appears in, in, in Mughal India, there could be some concept there that relates to Indic thought, not to Islamic thought, or something I did not mention. I think there's a bit of a difference between the gardens of Samarkand and the gardens, this is for, for Mughal India, not, not directly in response to this question, but perhaps the gardens of built on hillsides were terraced, I think the gardens of Bukhara were more like distributing water on a plain, and that's more like what we see, for example, at Homayun's tomb. I think there was a slight difference. So yes, the Mughals used uh, these intersections, only they did not use them for symbolic purposes. And I think there's no proof that they were used for symbolic purposes outside of Sri Lanka or India or Tibet, not in, in, in the Islamic context. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that answer. Uh, Neela Sina says that's actually a fantastic debunking of a myth. We'll now have a fantastic new mystery, Chahar Bhag, to solve. So thank you so much for that. Um, wow. I think uh, the next question is also by Professor Koch. Did not Barber and uh, his followers were keen to build gardens because they were the, they were the main... Th that was their main uh, form of residence. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, I perhaps I yeah. So this idea of the sarai or kushk or imarat as is as it as it becomes um, as it's pre predominantly called in the Mughal period in the Timurid period imarat. And I still haven't figured out if the imarat is a part of the residence or is a comprehensive name for the residence itself. So anyone who's got ideas is welcome to forward them. These were residences and they were to some extent self-supporting. A bit like a Villa Rustica, if you want in the Roman world, it was a place where you would enjoy life outside the busy and dusty cities, but it was also a source of revenue directly. I mean, you would eat the produce, but you also you were well off if you had one of those residences and you continued to be well off if they were well managed. 
these were landlords, I probably use this, this word. And, and, and this was an aristocracy that was predominantly uh, living the life of, of, of landlords. And we sort of forgotten that by calling them pleasure gardens. <clears throat> It's, it's actually fascinating to see them as residential uh, spaces. And then you mentioned Sarai. Um, and we we do not really see them through that perspective that, um, you know, we as you said, we limit ourselves to pleasure gardens and, <laughs> and uh, limit our thinking about these spaces. Uh, we have another question by Nikita Sharma. Her question is, could you please shed some light on the accessibility of these gardens to the non-elite? if primary sources mentioned anything like that? Well, that's interesting. Um, and um, so water was captured from a natural spring or carried from a distance. These were, if, if especially when it was carried, let's, let's take the, the, the hypothesis of, of water that was carried from a distance. This would allow an entire new district to be developed. Um, so these public works were too expensive for um, ordinary people to afford. So when there is a growth in population, why did this happen in, in Herat in the 15th century and not in the 13th? Because in the 13th century, the population of Herat was still trying to recoup and bounce back from the Mongol conquest. By the 15th century, um, we know from people who've studied the demographics, it was booming back and they needed uh, new land to support this added population. So the building of a Jui or a Rud, depending on what it was called in different areas, but or a Nah, in some areas it's called Nah, but it's always this big channel. And um, it allowed you to develop a whole district. And of course, the sources are focused on the houses of the elite. But there were villages that sprang around these gardens. There, were, there was produce that needed to be processed and sold on the markets. The water would flow into these residences of the elite, but then it flowed out and was distributed. And it, not all of it was dirty because most of the water, and we're told that in the Shada Sira, the, the agricultural treatise written in, in Timurid Herat, in the early 16th century, um, only a portion of the water would actually flow um, outside and, and was visible. The remainder would flow in underground conduits. You had uh, walkways above them and it came out of, of the garden pristine and clean and it was there for the community. Um, so people would use it. It would go to gardens that are not recorded in, in, the, in the histories, but they were gardens, meaning orchards, for ordinary people, for the middle class and, and, and you know, all of the other people that are not named and not covered by these sources, but they existed. So this actually supported the livelihoods of many more people. And you find some of that in Rashid Udin. For example, when he says that around Tabriz, where a lot of people had gathered in the hopes of finding jobs, probably, um, people had these, these little houses outside with their own gardens, which really must have been like vegetable kitchen gardens, if you want. And, and Razan Khan, Rashid Adin's patron, uh, that he always portrays in such a favorable light, said, well, we would need to rebuild the walls of Tabriz, but we can't really rebuild the old walls because we would destroy some of these houses. And then, you know, what would these people do? So let's build a bigger wall way beyond these new settlements. So we include all these houses and gardens. So sometimes, I mean, these smaller gardens appear in the sources when they serve the bigger picture. <laughs> That's absolutely, um, you know, it's absolutely fantastic to know about it. Uh, uh, Nicoleta Fazio uh, asks that, could you please dig a bit on the Sogdian and the specificities of their historical context that you briefly mentioned in your talk? It seems that it much turns around this corner of Central Asia. Sogdia? Well, I'm yeah. not an expert 
Nicoletta, you know I'm not an expert. <laughs> that is secondhand knowledge that I, I, I garnered from, from sources that I've consulted. And there's actually no friend of mine who would be way more equipped than myself to answer these questions. Um, Professor Ciro Lamuzzi in Rome, who's directed several um, archaeological expeditions in, in Uzbekistan. I don't know if he's out there with us today, but uh, he, might, he might be. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, the Sogdians have no one to speak for them, you know, and that's that's an interesting um, issue to bring up with with a group of students of history. Um, I see Timuri Gardens or Mughal Gardens as victims of, of the great game because Afghanistan was not on the map either for the British Empire or for the Tsars. And then with the Cold War again, that it was very polarized. You know, you had Iran, which was in the British sphere of influence, if you want, or the English speaking scholars were concentrated on Iran and the Russian scholars were concentrated in, in the Northern part of Central Asia. Nobody cared about Afghanistan, for example, again. And the Sogdians, they were not a big kingdom with big chronicles and big histories. They did not have a mythology of their own, you know, their language has uh, vanished. There's documents in their language, but much like the Syrians, the, the Syrian Christians that adopted Arabic and only kept Syriac as their own liturgical language, but they don't have a history of their own um, to tell, or it's not so well known because they belong nowhere in the modern nations of our time, you see. Uh, who wants the Sogdians? The Uzbeks are not their direct descendants. Um, you know, uh, the Tajiks are in some way their heirs, but then again, not their exact descendants. And um, I mean, it's a problem. What we know, we know from, from sources that are mostly, um, I think, um, commercial transactions on the Silk Route and then archeology, span but they haven't left us a much. Although some of the stories mentioned in the Shaname actually belong to, you know, somewhere further east than Iran within its current borders. So we could tap into those perhaps a bit. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am, for that answer. We have another interesting question, rather. Uh, Sukhdev Sol's, uh, Sukhdev Sol's uh, question is, uh, do we know the names of fruit plants the, uh, the, the Mughals brought from the Central Asia and planted in their uh, gardens? Well, I think melon was probably their biggest success, right? It is now a specialty of Agra, <laughs> sugared melon and... Uh, but it was originally introduced in Central Asia, and 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 it's it's a crop that really grows well uh, in in riverbeds. It grows well where there's where the water table is high, if you want, um, um, and the ground is loose. Um, there were things that worked and things that didn't quite work. I mean, you, of course, it's not easy to to um, grow apples in India, but you can grow them in Kashmir. And that's where, where the Mughals probably found it easier to, um, to grow um, crops more similar to, to Central Asia. So, yeah, I mean, I would, I, would, I would cite melon. I would put melon first in the list, which is a typical Central Asian fruit. Sorry, I forgot to sign it. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> How embarrassing. Okay, other questions? Yeah, uh, Shreyasi says that Baba's journal mentions melon and saffron uh, that was brought uh, that from Central Asia. Um, uh, I think before the next question, I, I do not see the next question right now. So those who wish to ask questions can ask in the live chat. Uh, all you have to do is to click on the subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything. It's just a red button uh, that uh, keeps us motivated uh, in Caravan. Um, but before that, I have a couple of announcements uh, while we wait for the next question. 
So this month is going to be full of great conversations and lectures uh, for all mm -hmm. of you. Tomorrow, which is 1st of Feb, we have Purushottam Agrawal, who is a noted Kabir scholar to talk about the medieval poet uh, Sant Kabir and his poetry, his time. Um, then on 5th of February, we have Pelva Naik, who is a very renowned young Dhrupad singer. Uh, Dhrupad is, as we all know, is the most ancient form of Indian classical music. On 8th of February, we have Sally Goldman, the noted Ramayana scholar, to talk about Ramayana. On 10th February, we have Philip Mars to talk about yoga, the history of yoga. On 13th of February, we have Anirudh Kanisethi, a young historian and writer who has just come up with his debut book on Deccan, Lords of the Deccan. On 15th Feb, we have Rachana Majumdar to talk about art cinema, India's forgotten futures. Uh, on 16th, we have Robert Goldman to talk about Ramayana again. And wow. on 20th Feb, we have another uh, scholar from Italy joining us, Alberto Pellicero, uh, to talk about the definition of uh, the, the, the meaning and the definition of Paribhasha itself. So these are some of the lectures which are lined up for all of you on Caravan. Some of them are exclusive for our Caravan book club members, which is uh, you, which you can see uh, on our YouTube channel for more details. So let's see if we have other questions. Uh, may I just may I just add one thing? Meanwhile, I wouldn't want to give the impression of wanting to replace one mythical narrative with another. No, 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 no. The, the <laughs> Mughal gardens are different from Central Asian gardens. They're, they're descendants, if you want, but these gardens, because they are gardens, because they need to um, engage with an environment. And every time the environment changes, even just with microclimate, you need to think that over again. And then of course, technology is different. And Mughal gardens are Indian, as much as they are Central Asian, if you want, or even more. But uh, it is, there was a transformation because when you think about it, it's, it's, it's the environment now, the banks of the Jumna, if you want, they're so different from what Barbara says. And it, it's probably for, for a reason, if, if the people in Agra adopt that Mughal suburb Kabul, because it was foreign at the time, but now it's an integral part of India. And what they planted there, and there's work, there's research work done, not by myself, by, by others, excellent work by Ebba Koch and Jim Westcote. And again, you know, and, and that book, if you've seen it, the Metabog book um, um, with, with various contributors, uh, on the plantings there, the plantings and even the water supply. Barbara says, you know, they used uh, wells because they needed to draw water from deeper down than they were used to. They used to a technology uh, that they'd seen in use in the Punjab. So even just the ecological basis of these gardens is different. It's just, it's an encounter and we need to see it as an encounter and encounters are always a way to progress, right? <laughs> Unlike closures and, and uh, you know, desires to adhere to ancient traditions, whatnot. You know, yeah. it's one I, thing to, yeah, so. You know, that, yeah. that's very important. And thank you so much for clarifying that to our audience. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so I don't see any question right now. So I would uh, request all of you who are watching us. If you have any other question, feel free to drop them. Uh, on our email, which is carvanheritage at gmail.com. We'll make sure to forward them to Professor Parodi and she can get back to you through emails. Absolutely. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, once again, for joining in, Professor Abacock, uh, James Westcott, and others who have joined us in the... So, so, in the so much. And uh, <laughs> looking forward to pursuing this dialogue with, with everyone and, and students, especially, because that's... The next generation, you know, you need it. That's you are the ones that are going to write the the the, right, the great things. <laughs> from well, thank now you on. so much, ma'am, for for agreeing to do this, and I think all of us will uh, benefit from this a lot, and hopefully, we uh, most of us will uh, pursue 
uh, this field and uh, uh, and 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 then we'll we'll move into research because i think in india especially unfortunately the is the research uh, is on the decline unfortunately but hopefully we can revive uh, the 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 trend of research again uh, with that thought i think uh, we'll end the live stream now but we have some questions for you that we'll record with you after the live stream which people okay. can watch on instagram so we'll we'll post that video later on instagram don't forget to check out that and our team also wants to ask you some questions that's off the record so we'll <laughs> we'll be we'll okay. it like that thank you so much everybody thank for joining you. in it was truly an honor having you all as our audience we'll meet again tomorrow on on zoom for our next session